This is where my chores start every morning now. Pretty much most of our animals are up in the field. Sheep feed, fish feed. Even though the animals are up in the field, uh, they're on pasture, they're eating grass, you know, all the different plants that are growing up there. They're rooting around, finding grubs and things. We still need to give them a feed. If you hear about pastured chickens and pastured pork or pastured pigs and you're new to the homesteading world, those animals are still getting fed feed, they still need it. Even like an IPP, an Idaho pastured pig, or a Cooney Cooney like the pigs we have, you still need to give them feed. And uh, there are benefits to having them out on the pasture. There are pros and cons to having them out in the pasture. Good things and bad. But yeah, still need to give them a feed. We're using Nature's Way feeds. Their feed is not only the, the protein levels that the animals need in a non-GMO, organic, no corn, no soy, all vegetable based feed. They also are fortified with the minerals that your animal needs. And that's a big element to even animals like, for example, sheep. I have sheep out on pasture right now. Sheep can be totally grass fed. They are a ruminant. They are designed to turn grass into protein. Well, they're designed to turn grass into whatever they need that eventually grows into them becoming protein. Well, they are protein. You get the idea. The point is, our pastures, the limited area that our sheep get to graze on, they're deficient. They're deficient in micronutrients, I don't actually know what they're deficient in. I haven't done any testing to our pastures. And one of the reasons I haven't worried so much about it is because we supplement their diet with a feed that is fortified with the minerals they need. We're gonna drive the gator up. I fill up all my buckets in the morning. I have, and they're color coded. Pink is obviously pig. Uh, sheep is orange because it's not pink. Uh, the big red one is for the chicken feed. I do the most chicken feed every day. Those meat chickens go through a lot of feed. I'm actually bringing up some seeds today broadcast behind the pigs. I'll talk about why I'm doing that when we get up there. Let's get up there. Got to turn the fence off. I do this so much. I come all the way up here and then I'm like, oh, I gotta turn the fence off. I wanna get one of those smart plugs that's Wi Fi activated that I can just turn it off from the field. It's an idea I got from Farmer Brad. Farmer Brad has some awesome ideas, by the way. If, if you don't follow him on YouTube, you should follow him and on Instagram. You get a lot of tidbits. Uh, I'll put a link below to Farmer Brad. Um, but yeah, his idea, I did an interview with him back. Well, way back, one of the things he shared was smart plugs because you can just turn off your fence from here. Now I gotta drive back down and go turn my fence off. If you think about it, these pastures, um, whatever they're deficient in, whatever nutrients they're deficient in, it's going to cause a, a domino effect. Okay, so just to give you an idea, your pasture should have, here's a quick article from Penn State Extension. They talk about the macro minerals and the micro minerals that you wanna have for dairy cows on your pasture. Calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, sodium, potassium, chloride, sulfur, those are the macros. Now the micros, iodine, iron, copper, cobalt, manganese, molybdenum, 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 there it is, molybdenum, zinc and selenium. And I believe it is selenium that in PA is deficient uh, in a lot of pastures, which, ready for this, uh, 
you have your animals out on pasture, they're nutrient deficient pastures, those animals become nutrient deficient, which won't kill your animals in the short run. If you run a bunch of Cornish crosses for eight weeks, they're not gonna even know they were nutrient deficient, they're dead. Uh, same with things like lambs. They're gonna be a, a shorter period of time. They're probably not gonna die because they're deficient in one of those micronutrients. Your dairy cows are gonna have issues because they're around a long time, and that's why you see it more in the world of like dairy, people concerned about things like that. But if your lamb is deficient in those minerals, so will the steak be that you eat from that lamb. Same with the Cornish crosses, same with your pork. The animals that you eat are made up of micro and macronutrients too. And you can find those in your food on your plate or you can find the absence of those. And if it's a problem for a dairy cow to be deficient in their micro and macronutrients, I would be willing to just take a wild guess and say it's probably a bad thing for a human being who's supposed to live at least, you know, 70, 80, 90 years to be deficient in those minerals. Not a doctor, not making any bold claims here, not prescribing you anything, but just, just something that you want to think about. So, making sure that even your animals that are on pasture are getting the minerals they need is very important. And you've seen this done on YouTube in many different ways. Some people bring the minerals out, loose minerals, uh, all the minerals, individual choice minerals. Uh, some people just have a mineral block that's sitting there. We like to use the minerals in Nature's Way feeds because the animals like to eat the feed. They come and gobble it up and each one cup of feed is balanced. All the minerals that animal needs is in that cup of feed. So if they eat the cup of feed, they're getting the ratios of minerals they need with that feed. Now the nice thing about feeding them this on pasture and moving them through is, let's say they're not deficient in a certain mineral and they pee some of that mineral out. Guess where it goes? In our pasture where we need it. So it's a good thing you're not just feeding your animals, you're feeding your soil, you're feeding the, the vegetation that is feeding your animals. And ultimately, what I always say when I talk about like why we use nature's, nature's way feeds, you're feeding your family. So whatever you feed your animals, they feed you. So you are what you eat eats. And that's why I get the best quality feed out there. I'll have a link below which will get you wholesale pricing on Nature's Way feeds. And please, if you're in the Western Pennsylvania area, I'm getting a pickup soon. You wanna get some? I'll throw your bags on my uh, truck. We can split the cost of shipping. Let me know, Austin, this is Homesteady, email me. And we'll come up with a way to split the cost of a truck so that we can all get this really great feed. Now I'm gonna move my cows first. The, the first thing I do is move the cows each day. I'm gonna go and do that right now. And I think Luna, she's watching me. She knows I'm gonna open this up. She'll be by in a minute. I bet you anything she walks by the camera because she wants that yummy fresh grass. I've started taking my coffee to go in the morning. This time of year it's so hot. We normally have morning coffee before we do the chores, but now I take one coffee out and do the chores. And uh, I've been having my kind of coffee chat, coffee moments on Instagram. Every morning I'm doing a story on Instagram, just kind of sharing what's going on, having coffee talks, filming the animals and the craziness that's happening. If animals are getting out, you're seeing it usually on Instagram. Uh, so if you missed the daily camel train videos that we did, and speaking of which, we have a camel train shout out to read in a minute here. Uh, if you're missing that daily updates, over on Instagram, if you click there, you can go check out our Instagram feed uh, or a link below, link below for the Instagram feed. Uh, you can follow me every single day. I'm posting something on Instagram. And maybe this morning I will post a little behind the scenes about the video we're shooting. That would be cool. I actually like have an Instagram live. Now Instagram happens in real time. 
So while these videos you normally have to wait a couple days for, Instagram is live. So, good morning Instagram. I'd like to introduce you to YouTube. Uh, right now I'm filming a YouTube video and talking about how people should be following on Instagram for daily happenings. Like when Tiny gets out. There she goes again. Now the Instagram audience knows every day Tiny gets out, but YouTubers might not know this because I don't share the everyday happenings on YouTube, but there's Tiny out with the sheep. Tiny, what are you doing? <laughs> she is, Tiny's the worst. We talked about her yesterday on Instagram. Uh, she just kind of like, whenever she wants to come say hello in the morning, when she sees me roll up with all the feed, she knows it's time to eat. She slips under the fence because I turn the fence off when I come to work on it. Tiny knows when I'm here, she can totally slip under the fence and not get hurt. She's a smart pig, which means she's probably destined for freezer camp. So don't get too attached to Tiny, because smart pigs, if you ever read Animal Farm, you know, smart pigs, they're dangerous. Now I gotta add a little poll to my Instagram. I do the polls, I'm gonna ask everybody today. You can comment in the YouTube comments below. Did you read Animal Farm? I loved Animal Farm, it's totally my style of book. Okay, done with an Instagram post for today. But I'll add to it throughout the morning. I'll actually talk about little you know, tips and things I've learned with our setup and what's going on. And it's more than just talking about books that we've read. Uh, although sometimes that's what it is. It's like a coffee talk, updates, tips. Don't miss out on the Instagram feed. Let's do a camel train shout out before I forget. This is the last camel train shout out. We have, uh, I waited a while because I didn't want to do a shout out on one of our sad ladybug videos because I thought that was kind of a bummer to get like a sad ladybug. Richard found us a couple months ago. He was at the time going through a slowdown at work. He didn't realize it was going to soon to be complete unemployment. Uh, but the nice thing is Richard's been watching a lot about homesteading. He's been getting inspired and he's thinking about maybe not going back to work. Maybe just diving in 100% into homesteading which is... Uh, yeah, it's the best way to do things Richard. I love homesteading. Just make sure uh, You know make sure you got what you need to take that leap full-time, but yeah Homesteading beats going to the nine-to-five every day. Uh, he recently moved to Texas Richard is looking forward to a homesteading and permaculture future uh, right now He's in an apartment, but he's gonna be working on change in that so Richard. I hope that transition goes well uh, you know Homesteading is something you build, I talk about this a lot, it's like a, a tree. You grow slowly over time, you send roots down deep. Don't grow too fast and furious because then you can burn out and fail more. Uh, so slow and steady, grow it slow and steady and you will be so happy that you made this transition. So thank you for joining the camel train. That's the last one everybody, we, we sold all the camel train tickets. I had made that goof and left a couple at the end, but we sold those out real quick and I waited to do Richard's till we didn't have a sad video which, uh, you know, this week is the final week for Ladybug. We had a little bit of a delay. You saw in my last video about building the butcher shop with the cool bot. It worked great. The cool bot chilled that room right down to 40, but to age meat, you gotta get under 40. And what I learned working with the people at Coolbot, they were really, really awesome about uh, customer support. I learned so much during this project. They taught me that concrete block, which is what the root cellar is made of, is not an insulator, it's a conductor. So the root cellar is down on the ground, it's 55 degrees, but the concrete block is pulling that temperature in to where the cool bot is trying to freeze it and get us under 40, the concrete block's like, no, heat this up. So it's an endless cycle of just heating up and cooling the concrete block, which meant we couldn't get it cold enough to age me. So I was able to butcher my first lamb. Uh, you'll notice there's only three behind me. Uh, we needed some lamb. It was still a little small, but uh, I wanted to test the new butcher house out. We needed some lamb, it kind of all the stars aligned, and we decided to put a lamb in the freezer. I ate that lamb yesterday. So good. The lambs we are raising are Katahdin. Uh, they're right there <laughs> above my shoulder. Um, I don't know if it's the, the pasture quality, I don't know if it's 
the Nature's Way feeds that we're giving them. I don't know if it's the breed. I don't have enough experience with lamb to know. But man, those lamb shanks, which is my favorite cut, lamb shanks are the best, for me, the best part of a lamb is the shank. Oh man, that was such a nice meal. Kay cooked it up for me. Uh, so yeah, we tested out the butcher room. It worked great, but I do need to get it colder. So tomorrow I have a guy coming to spray foam and insulate the inside of the, the whole place with, with closed cell foam, about three inches thick. It'll lock in our temperature. And at that point we will be able to age meat, which is, you know, means we can butcher ladybug, and have her meat actually properly handled in this cool room, kept at the right temperature, kept safe from bacteria growing and spreading. And we have had a lot of people follow up, ask that question, is the meat safe to eat? Yes, as long as it stays clean, as long as we don't you know, get fecal matter on the meat, and I've field dressed enough animals and butchered enough animals in my past to know we can do that successfully. So uh, yeah, we're gonna be working on that. So there will be a sad video this week. Uh, the Ladybug's last video will be coming out this week. Um, so yeah, heads up for that. Also tonight, I have a great interview happening at five, well, right now, if you're a Homesteady Pioneer, dip into the Pioneer Live from the Barn Show. We're talking about the economy with YouTube and podcast host, John Puglano from Wealth Studying Podcast. Uh, we're gonna be talking about COVID's effect on the economy, uh, our businesses, our finances, how we can protect ourselves. I think big part of homesteading is just making smart financial decisions. And uh, so John's coming on to talk about that. So I hope you can join me for that. If not, you'll see the edited version will come out here in a week or so. So stay tuned for that. All right, uh, time to go feed the sheep. And sheep are really scared of me. So I want you to see how the feed is helping with this situation. It's helping them get to be not as afraid of me. Did you see those chickens get out? Why didn't you say something? I gotta go get all these chickens and I'll tell you what happened. Oh man, these guys are hard to catch. Well, it was 20 minutes trying to catch all those chickens. In John Siskovich's book with the chicken tractor plans, uh, one of the things John does that I, I love, Luna's getting called by Kay. She's going in for milking. It's cool to see. That's cool. I heard Kay call, come on girls, and Luna just was like, took off running. So in John's book, The Chicken Tractor Plans, he encourages you to make your own changes, to figure out things that will work better for you. Um, and then he suggests a couple upgrades, which he didn't do, but he thought would be cool. He didn't do them because he had like, 20 chicken tractors to make and it would have cost a fortune for his business model. But if you're only doing a few for your homestead, uh, there are cool upgrades. And one of them was auto closing doors, hinges that auto close. And they are a lifesaver because you can just walk in with your hands full of stuff and they'll close behind you. Love the upgrade and I did it and it works really good. 99 days out of 100 but today the door got stuck on some grass and I didn't see it I wasn't paying attention and all those chickens I had to be 20 chickens got out of there I was fun 
But I'll show you what it looks like when they work. It works really nice. That's what's supposed to happen. It closes behind you like that. You also notice I have these tarps bungeed together now, both sides. That's to give my sheep a little shade hide spot because they need some shade up here. It's wide open sun. Uh, also, another great little mod, that one I thought of, just to take the side flaps, hook them together, and now you have a little shade structure for your sheep if you're running sheep with your chicken tractors, which I think you should because sheep are so easy on the land. They mow the grass in front of the tractor, making it easier to move your chicken tractors. It all works well really, really nice together. I'm gonna do a video soon about like mods to chicken tractors, things I've done to John's that I like that maybe John didn't suggest or, or maybe I do it different than John. Uh, overall, these chicken tractors have been awesome. They have made doing meat birds a pleasure. We've been eating our first batch of meat birds so good. Tender, delicious, juicy. Uh, I've never raised chickens in a tractor all day. We used to use a tractor and they didn't have enough room in the chicken tractor so we had to let them run around. And I do think letting them run around a lot more toughens the meat up. This keeps them every day on fresh grass but they don't run around a bunch. And uh, they get fresh pasture every day, they're happy, they're healthy, but man, are they tender, juicy, delicious. And uh, it's been some awesome chicken. So if you want to build John's tractors, the plans, are, I'll have a link below to the chicken tractor plans or you can click there. Uh, I can't say enough good things and it's not too late to do chickens this year. I just ordered another batch of meat birds through Tractor Supply. I got 80 meat birds. So you still have two months. If you order through Tractor Supply, you'll get them next week and you'll have two months to do them and you'll be butchering before, it's perfect time in the fall to butcher. You'd be looking right now into like September and awesome time to butcher animals. Nice and cool out, but not too cold. And yeah, just do it. Get some meat in the freezer, stock up. Uh, you know, with this COVID spike, people are gonna get crazy again. I think we'll see some food runs again. Have your meat in the freezer. Put, put 50 birds up, that's one a week for your family for the next year. Makes you feel real good to have a lot of meat in your freezer. So get ahead of that. Order those meat birds. Stop waiting. Get John's book. Build some chicken tractors. You'll, if you order the book today and you order your chickens today, you'll have five weeks to finish building it because they shouldn't really go out till about week four. Uh, so you'll have five weeks and the chickens will be there. I never suggest you get the animals before the infrastructure is done, but maybe you need a little kick in the butt. Maybe you need a little like, do this. So order your book today and order your chickens today. And you'll be like, oh man, I gotta finish that chicken tractor. And you'll finish it. Cause if you don't, you're gonna be really angry at yourself. So do it, finish it. And uh, yeah, get some meat birds in the freezer before next year. You'll feel a lot better doing it. And now it'll be done and coming to the, to the spring, you can do a couple batches like we did this year. We put almost 300 chickens. When we're all said and done this year, it's gonna be almost 300 chickens in our freezer. That's enough for us, plenty and more. So just do it. Just give yourself a little kick. Don't Maybe don't get 50 if it's your first time. Maybe just get 10 or 20. Uh, 20 even is a lot, but this has been a year that I've pushed myself and, and maybe I, I'm not afraid to push you a little bit. If you've been holding back and waiting and oh, I don't know, I don't know, and COVID came and went and came back again now and whatever, just do it. Just get those chickens, build the chicken tractor, get the plans. I, I can't say enough good things about these chicken tractors. They work so well. Um, you're gonna be so happy with them and you're gonna learn a lot when you build them. So just do it. Uh, I've been thinking about, some people have been asking me if I would do a online butcher day course. I used to teach butchering. And I think I might do that this fall. Our butcher day coming up is in, a it would be in about eight weeks. So if you order your birds now, you'll have a bird or two that are big enough to butcher along with us on butcher day. And then you can butcher the rest of them a week later once you know how to do it. I might do it. So comment below if you'd like me to do an online butcher course where it would be over Zoom. You would join us for the Saturday where we all butcher some chickens and you'd be able to have your Zoom video on on your phone so you could say like, hey Aust, what do I do? I cut the chicken but it's still running around or whatever. I can answer your questions. It might be a fun event, you know, a little chicken plucking party. So let me know if you'd be interested in that. And uh, if enough people say yes, I want to do that on a Saturday in two months, then uh, I'll do it. We'll have a little chicken plucking party, virtual, COVID friendly.
You can see the sheep are already using their little shade hut. Works great for that. Love that feature. I needed a straight shade structure. I didn't have to build a new one. I already got one. As you can see, I could do it over here to this one if I had more sheep and uh, we'd be good to go. I could even do the ones off the sides with little stakes, little tents. And when it rains, it fills up and it just falls down the middle and the sheep tuck to either side and they're fine. Last stage of this whole armada, I'm calling this our grass-fed armada. That'd be a cool shirt. The pigs, the grass-fed, pastured, grazing pigs that we have, they do some rooting, especially because I put them behind the chicken tractors to clean up the meat birds' spilled feed. They do a great job at vacuuming up that feed. In the process, they are rooting up our pastures, and that's not great. So I may pull the pigs off of this completely if they are doing too much damage doing that. And uh, you know what? It's all part of a learning experience. If I didn't put them behind the chickens, they've, I've been on, they've been on other sections of the pasture where they haven't been rooting so much because we fed them in pans and we made sure they had the minerals. Pigs will root for their minerals if you're not getting their minerals through good quality feed, like I said, nature's, uh, nature's way feed or another feed that you know puts the right minerals in there. Uh, a lot of people with, with grazing pigs will put double the minerals in their mineral, in their feed so that the grazing pigs have no reason to look for those minerals and root. But I put them there to clean up the mess that I see these meat birds wasting feed. They're not eating it all and I knew the pigs would eat it. I may change this. I may put egg laying chickens in the back here and let them free range within the confines of an electric fence that we have up. They could pick up the seeds with a lot less damage. I don't know. Our pastures right now have a lot of weeds in it that I don't mind the pigs kind of going and, and scruffing up. What I'm doing now is I'm following everybody with a broadcaster. There is a lot of exposed dirt here and there are seeds that you can broadcast to expose tilled soil and they'll, they'll work just fine. So what I have here, I have some buckwheat. Buckwheat is a great no-till option. Uh, you can broadcast it to expose dirt and it will come up. And the nice thing about buckwheat is it puts out a huge leaf, it dominates the soil, and buckwheat will prevent a lot of weeds from growing because it has such a huge leaf. I also have some rye. Rye will grow in the bed of a pickup truck. It grows everywhere, it goes easily, it grows fast. You want to dominate your soil. If you leave these bare patches, weeds will follow and they will come up. So I'm gonna try this. This is all a test. It might work great. I might see in a year I have better quality pastures with less weeds, more things I put there on purpose, better you know nutrients in my pastures. I might find, you know what? The pigs destroyed it. It's a crater, moon face, and it's you know all weeds now. That's part of learning. Life is full of mistakes that will teach you things. Yesterday my kids made jam and the jam became candy. They added way too much sugar. We let them kind of experiment. We didn't tell them, hey, you're putting too much sugar in that pot. It's gonna become candy. Because I know my kids think, hey, more sugar the better. Well, yesterday they learned more sugar doesn't always mean better. And that's a good life lesson for making jam or other things too. So I might be about to fail, or I might be about to discover something great. Some of you might already know the ending here and you'll comment below what the ending's gonna be. Others of you might think you know the ending and find out you're wrong. That's part of scientific method learning. Let's go seed a pasture with broadcast. Okay, I broadcasted this one little tip. I didn't do it this time because I didn't think of it, but I'm gonna do it next time. I think this would have been better to do before I mowed. I mowed behind everybody, uh, partially to just to smooth out the craters and to cut the weed heads that were still left. I think what I'll do next time, when I move these pigs out of this next section and there's some craters and devastation, I'm going to broadcast and then I'm going to mow. And what that'll do is all the seed I've broadcast, running over it with the tires, the tractor will compact it into the soil, helping to just you know get it in there before the birds get them. The, he the grass that cuts and falls will fall on top of them, providing a bit of a moss layer to keep them moist and hidden from the birds. And I might get a better result. I already did it here, I already mowed, so oh well. 
another idea for next time. We'll see if that improves things. Gonna experiment. We're gonna go this entire strip all the way down to the end of the field experimenting. And at the end of the summer, I'll be able to come back to the beginning and go, that looks great. Or, ooh, that looks like garbage. I'm only doing it with this one strip. I'm not doing it with my whole entire pasture. So if this works great, I'll do it with the whole pasture next year. If this works awful, I will have sacrificed about a third of my pasture. I don't have my pastures maxed out. I don't need all this pasture right now. This is all a science experiment for next year when I have more animals. And so I'll be able to make better decisions next year with more of my land. And I feel like that's the best way to run your homestead. One of the things Kay and I have had a big kind of revelation about this year, and it's been a long time in coming, but it's kind of come to a head this year, is that like the experts are not experts. There are people out there who know a lot about things in a particular situation might have some really good answers for you. And, and one of the things I do all the time with the Home Study Pioneer program is we interview people who are very knowledgeable in certain areas. But what I mean about like experts aren't experts is that you're not, when you, you're in, you can be an expert in like one thing. You can have learned, John Siskovich knows a lot about raising chickens in a chicken tractor, right? He is an expert at that. But that doesn't mean he is all knowing about everything about a chicken and if he says it, it must be the truth. Fact is, like, you know, there's a lot of things you can learn about chickens and use chickens for and do with chickens that maybe John likes to do or doesn't like to do and it might work better for you elsewhere. So, so we're, what we're doing a lot now is just kind of experience, experimenting on our own, on our own property with our own management practices. Because I could go find a forage expert and say, this is a good idea and one of them will say yes and one of them will say no because they are not experts at everything. Uh, which one is right, it's gonna be hard to tell. So I find the best thing to do is on your homestead, learn from other people, source the information, logically build an idea out of experts' teachings, but then try your own things and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, you can conclusively say, on my property, with my management style, I don't care what the experts say, this doesn't work. Or, on my property, with my management style, these experts were correct and this method does work for me. And that's like the best way to run your homestead. Gather the information, put together a logical plan, and then actually see if it works. Don't just read something in a book and say, well, this book says it's not gonna work, or this book says this will definitely work. You gotta try it, and you gotta try it at a smaller scale, and then grow it. And that's how you will become an expert at homesteading on your property. Because that's really all that matters, is that you become an expert at growing your homestead the way you want to homestead. And that that's what we're trying to do, is just, become experts at the things we want to do here and, and learn the best we can. And we learn a lot through mistakes and that's how you're gonna learn too. We learn a lot through learning from people who've done it more than us. That's a great way to do it. But then we combine knowledge of others with our own mistakes and find, it, find the ways that work for us.